This is the story all about how CSS was made. It's the year 2000, the Willennium, Charlie's Angels, and The Rock as WWF Champion. AOL and Yahoo dominate the web, and CSS is slowly making progress. We previously saw how CSS became the winning solution and was adopted by browsers in part, but that chapter is far from over. Building things the CSS way was hard, required hacks and a balancing act, even just for two browsers, whilst non-CSS solutions looked relatively more appealing. Books like David Siegel's Creating Killer Websites offered alternative solutions that worked, albeit with mega hacky methods. Need consistent spacing? Just add a one pixel transparent image and stretch its dimensions to create the space needed. And multi-column layouts? Well, you can use HTML tables, of course. These solutions were a last resort and would stick around for the next decade or so as industry standards, primarily because they were more consistent than messing around with floats and padding. It's easy to criticize these horrible workarounds and the bad practices they set in place, but this was a result of developers being creative and finding solutions the kind of users you'd want using your technology. CSS had been focus grouped by its users and the feedback was... Nah. It's worth considering also the unworkable process of front-end development for creatives. Unlike Photoshop, where a visual person intuitively works visually on a visual tool that gives visual feedback, building web pages involves typing out symbols and instructions into a web editor, which gives varied visual feedback depending on the browser, with little feedback as to why it's not working. It's hard to feel creative when you're making an oil painting with an etcher sketch. In 2001, Adobe launched Dreamweaver, which featured a design and code view toggle. The visual WYSIWYG editor allowed users to drag elements into place and build web pages without needing to know any code, and then view the code generated in the background. With DevTools far off in the future, this made for a helpful learning tool and improved understanding. Many learned to make websites in Dreamweaver, then moved to Sublime, and then made fun of people using Dreamweaver. In terms of intuitive visual design interface, however, there was a new rival on the scene. Macromedia Flash emerged in the late 90s as primarily an animation software used for games and funny videos. Rather than a complicated text-based interface, users could draw, style, and drag elements, then use the timeline to transition their properties. Your project would export a giant lump Swift file that could then sit on a web page which worked fine in the era before massively varied screen sizes. Most importantly, all your design, text, styles, and functionality was baked into the Flash file, meaning no browser issues or differences. Why wouldn't you use Flash instead? What's SEO? Armed with the new tool, designers really went to town. Suddenly every page asked you to wait 10 minutes for it to load up and hit you with music and dancing menus and shot you through a wormhole every time you click something. As the true Buzz Lightyear to CSS Woody, everyone quickly won over by the new capabilities at their fingertips. How comes you don't have animations, Woody? But these strengths would end up being Flash's undoing. With no UX patterns, confusing layouts, and that caching issue, it never offered a full replacement for standard HTML and CSS, instead being a go-to for fancy brochure sites. But Flash did offer a glimpse into how the web could be, and challenged native technologies in terms of design. Examples often cited in this era are Wired.com and ESPN, who launched sites a few months apart using semantic, consistent, and well-designed HTML and CSS. Shining examples suggested CSS can deliver great results, just with a bit of work. In 2003, Jeffrey Zeldman, of WASP fame, published his book Designing with Web Standards, which became a sort of handbook for web designers looking to switch to standards-based design. The emphasis was on making sites accessible, SEO-friendly and well-structured, features in which Flash was severely lacking. Sites like eBay exist now. The emergence of professional websites with actual uses had turned web development into a professional industry, which required knowledgeable experts to craft well-made products. Now your ability to create beautiful sites to a high standard was a valuable commodity, so it's a good time to brush up on some CSS. Also in 2003, Dave Shea creates the CSS Zen Garden. The name is perfect. Beauty, simplicity, equality. Take a simple HTML document and apply standards compatible CSS to make a beautiful outcome. 
and many took up the challenge. It was a simple concept about proving CSS could be rich and imaginative, varied and innovative. It also became a fantastic inspiration and learning resource for developers. Jeffrey Zelman said, Hundreds of designers have made their mark and sometimes their reputations by creating Zen garden layouts, and tens of thousands all over the world have learned to love CSS because of it. It was certainly a good time to focus on cross browser success, as the IE dominance was soon to face fresh challenges from Mozilla's Firefox and Apple's Safari. There were also emerging signs of the mobile web, a whole fresh set of web design headaches, with the Palm One, Trio and Blackberry in 2003. Meanwhile the iPod is changing the music industry, and websites are growing in scale and complexity. CSS simplicity was a big part of its success, but it also made it a little frustrating. Sites running into several thousands of lines could become messy and unwieldy. Refactoring out unused styles was a minefield, and global changes relied mainly on the Find Replace tool. As projects started to grow, CSS needed a little guidance, and a few helpful options arrived in the mid noughts Two CSS properties walk into a bar. A bar store and a completely different bar falls over. This off-repeat and joke describe the fraught risk of making changes in CSS files. Writing CSS is easy and then very hard. You start with an empty page, you throw in classes and selectors as you go, then you take a step back at a dumpster fire of code. Selectors could clash and overwrite each other. Using IDs and classes together means you need to use important to stand out. You could accidentally use the same class name twice, and you could add lots of the same styles over and over, breaking that whole dry principle. Not having the feel of a strict programming language gave people room to make messes, but also to define a manageable system of their choosing. Grouping selectors, avoiding IDs, and creating separate files that compiled together became common best practices, and there emerged popular naming conventions like BEM. BEM, or Block Element Modifier, was developed by Yandex in 2005 as a way of scoping class names with a semantic logical convention. Instead of viewing the page as a wild assortment of random junk, you identify the sections of the page and their contained elements and any variations. Then making kind of annoying long class names, everything has a clear label about where it belongs, what it does and any status. Not only did this avoid the need to enter specificity wars and risk a completely different bar falling over, but it enabled devs to take a high level architectural view of their code, preempting the component driven approach by over a decade. 2006 saw the first version of SAS, or Sassy CSS. As the name suggests, rather than a direct competitor to CSS, files written in SAS could then be compiled into CSS, meaning you could control how a CSS file is output. This was some of that lovely functionality juice left out of CSS from the start. You could nest selectors inside one another, use variables and mix-in functions to reduce duplication, even do for loops and other mathsy stuff. Using SAS would make development quicker and less prone to errors. And once you go SAS, you never go back. It was 2006 when the world passed 100 million websites, and the web settled into everyday habits. CSS had proven its worth as its users grew in confidence, but the coming challenges for mobile design would require yet another innovation of features and practices. In the next chapter, we'll look at the arrival of CSS3 the prisoner of Azkaban of CSS versions. <laughs>